Hello and welcome to The Speakeasy, the live weekly show from Speak Life. This week we talk about tennis star Novak Djokovic, we ask is Australia open and we also take a dive into a movie of the late 90s. Hey! That's exciting. <laughs> Have we not got a stinger? I thought that was <laughs> you were expecting another stinger. We were expecting else another video. That. No, like that. Yeah, oh, see, we've not just seen it. Well, okay. <laughs> we'll we'll be good. right back after this. <laughs> Welcome back. And we're back. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. Well, this is good. Anyway, so anyway, yeah. well, welcome to the Speakeasy. My name's Paul Feasy, and as always, I'm joined by... <laughs> Glenn Scrivener. And <laughs> I'm Nate Morgan Long. <laughs> so, um... As has just been shown, the speakeasy is going to be taking a slightly different format from now on, okay. uh, which clearly doesn't involve that second stinger, which is uh, wow. really nice to let me know that before we started, quite frankly. <laughs> <laughs> a stinger, for those just joining us, is a video. Yeah, it's a, a short, a short a little video. little thing you yeah. just watched. Yeah. 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 yeah, and so rather than each episode being devoted just to kind of one topic for like the whole thing, we're actually going to be diving into a few different sections in the show, and some of those things will recur each week. Mm -hmm. We also have kind of different bits. And one of those recurring sections is going to be what we've always done, which is really looking at something going on in the culture and in the news. Mm -hmm. And we're going to think about it a bit from a Christian perspective. And that's where we're going to start today. Um, and we're going to think about an item that's been in the news for the last few days. And it's the events surrounding Novak Djokovic and his arrival in Australia for the Australian Open. So yeah. what is the story here? So we've, we've picked a really short one that we can deal with. <laughs> just, just rattle it off. So vaccinations point. and borders and yeah. the place of celebrity and COVID. Um, so we'll, we'll knock that on the head. Non-controversial thing. Yeah. Yeah, nice no one will be that fussed about. Um, I, I think speaking as an Australian, I, I feel I can add, add value here. Yeah. Yeah? You've got to explain yeah. what's going on. What is going on? Down under. I, I think I would just throw into the mix sort of three cultural things. Um, well, what is going? Yeah, well, before before, before we go, go, okay. Before we okay. what? Just give us a brief idea. Of what is the thing? Because some people might be like me, kind of yeah. be a bit like tennis. So, okay, Novak Djokovic is a tennis player, which is a game <laughs> involving a ball about this size. You hit <laughs> over the up, over the net. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And he's rather good at the game. He gets mm. it over the net most of the time. Mm. And he is the reigning Australian champion, and he's going for his 21st Grand Slam. So there are four Grand Slams every year, and the Australian Open is one of them. Yep. And, uh, and so he's going back to defend his title. He's going, back, he's going to Australia to be the greatest tennis player in the universe ever. Mm. Um, but the, there's a couple of hurdles he's got to get over. I mean, for a start, he's been sort of famously um, unvaccinated vaccinated and back in april 2020 he sort of said i don't really trust the vaccines yep. mm -hmm. um and you know he's he's a sportsman who like many sportsmen um are very fastidious about what they put into their body but he is particularly fastidious yep. about what he puts into his body he he you know claims that his great success is due to certain diets that are in, like very specific mm. um but yeah he he does not want the vaccine in his body and he's been quite skeptical and, and hesitant about having the vaccine he still has not had the vaccine until um, he says he got COVID in December. And in mid-December, he tested positive um, for COVID. And that then gives him a med medical exemption under Australian law for him to be able to come into the country unvaccinated and participate in the tournament. So mm. he arrives at Tullamarine Airport in Melbourne. Uh, he's detained by the authorities. Um, mm -hmm. He is put into quarantine. He is, um, he then challenges, his lawyers kind of challenge his detention. And he is, is he now a free man? I think, yeah, because mm. the judge has overturned the cancellation of his visa. Yeah. Mm. And I mean, it remains to be seen. You know, what else is going to happen? This is sort of unfolding story. Yes. And, and part, of, part of it is this sort of uh, Australian issue in that it, it is very politically um, supercharged in that Melbourne is the most or one of the most locked down cities in all the world and has locked down for more days than pretty much any other city right. on the planet for mm -hmm. the last two years. Australia has taken um, a very, a very locked down approach to COVID, um, and 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 I think Australia is a much more safety conscious place than certainly than Britain. It's it's quite a lot more conformist than say Britain, certainly than America. 
um, I once did a rant, I think, on, on this program about Australians at p- pedestrian crossings. You know, if you go to Sydney, you'll, you'll notice that everyone is just queuing up, like obeying the little red man. Because you okay. will not cross against the against the little red man, yeah. um, and I kind of I pointed this out on 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 a speakeasy years ago, and people were like you actually crossed against the red man. You, you know that's against the law, don't you? Um, so it's it's it's, it's, it's yeah. is much more conformist, much more law abiding than I am. Um, uh, safety conscious, very egalitarian, massively into mateship, and massively into not getting ahead of yourself, not getting a big head, not having tickets on yourself, not being a tall poppy, even more than the UK. UK is very much into cutting down tall poppies. Australia is that on steroids. And so Scott Morrison, the Australian Prime Minister, has been like, if you think you're somebody, Novak Djokovic, you can get on the next plane home, Mm -hmm. which is a very, very common Australian feeling. And it looks like in the polls that Novak Djokovic is not the most popular human being on the planet. And the yeah. 60% of Australians yeah. are outraged that he would come to the country unvaccinated and think that he can get away with it. So yeah. that's where we are. And so why is it, what's the story, what's the myth of Australia that means that you end up with a kind of, you know, absolute conformity mm. and you have this kind of tall poppy syndrome where everyone's got to be at the same level? So you have to abide by the laws all the time and yeah. no one's allowed to get above themselves. Well, the, I mean, the, the, the joke in England is that, well, you're all descended from convicts. But, you know, yeah. one of the realities of that is that we're also all descended from prison guards. Um, yeah. But I think part, part of the founding myths of Australia, there's, there's a massive um, sort of mythology of the outback, even though Australia is one of the most urbanized countries on the planet. Our right. massive myth is of the outback and and the the drovers and the and the you know working on your property and and pulling together and mateship against the elements right um which is which is very much a leveling kind of a thing and then world war 1 was a massive you know, we had our baptism of fire, Australians and New Zealanders, yeah. you know, being sent over the top by the toffs, you know, the, the English generals sending Australians to their doom at Gallipoli and, yeah. and that sort of thing. And so Australians are all in it together, very egalitarian, very pulling together, very, very mateship yeah. and not thinking that you're special. And so here comes Nov- Novak Djokovic. Yeah. And, you know, just because who cares? You know, and we're going we're gonna to show to you that you're nothing special and you'll get on the next plane home if yeah. you think and you're... you have to you have to go to the same sort of detention center holding bay right. quarantine hotel whatever it's right. called as everybody else yes and you don't get to bring your private chef that you're used to having yeah and yeah. because rules are rules said okay. Scott Morrison yeah which then is interesting because now we've had the judgment that they went before a court and the judges said that yeah. actually he did have the, the legal exemption and you know he jumped through the correct hoops to come in um, there is still the potential I think that the immigration minister could still eject him from the country wow. okay even though the law <laughs> says he could and at that point is it rules or rules right or, or you've got to make it, there's a tall puppy yeah. here yeah okay you know so you make an exception of him yeah. make an example he has of, to be shown yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there's there's lots going on. There's lots going on. Um, so I guess some of the question uh, has been around like whether he whether he actually had a visa to get in in the first place. Mm-hmm. Now, presumably, to have your visa cancelled, you must have had a visa in the first place. You mm-hmm. would that that seem you would assume. You would assume. Yes, well, yeah, I've seen yeah. some people say that you get your visa online. You say you know you would have to say I have a medical exemption. They mm-hmm. would have to say yes, that's all good, and then you'd have to prove it on arrival. Yeah. And it's not until it's sort of approved by a, an immigration official. So there's some yeah, there seems the to be land. some debate yeah. as to whether who was it that he got this exemption from. You know, from mm-hmm. was it through the tennis association or something like that, mm-hmm. or is it through some official thing in yeah. Australia? But surely, I, in my assumption, those two have got to cross over at some point before he arrives anyway. You do, the visa must go through an official channel, even well, online, before yeah. you get there. But you'd also think with someone like Novak Djokovic, whose international travel is insane, 
right? How many different countries mm-hmm. does he go to every single year? How many people are in his entourage and mm-hmm. booking his plane tickets, yeah. right? Yeah. It's not like he was there personally on the website filling in his details. <laughs> He's got people, yes, people. who are <laughs> helping to make I mean, tennis happen. players, they don't even pick up their own balls. Like, well, literally, that's, that's there's a ball at their feet. Yeah, and tennis, <laughs> there are three tennis is literally the be. most privileged. Like, yeah. you must right. not do anything. Other than play tennis, we yes. will we will come and hold an umbrella <laughs> over your head, yeah, for the period of time that you need it to be there, and bring you, you yeah. know, chill drinks and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, and and if if there's a problem with a line call from one of the how many have you got five, six be, know, line yeah, judges, yeah. 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 right. Yeah. Yeah. You appeal to the higher authority. Right. So it's kind of interesting that actually Nova Djokovic <laughs> is told, oh, you yeah. didn't do this and you've got to go and you know sit in this sort of yes. weird sort of holding hotel or something. Yeah. And then he, what does he do? He appeals, looks up to the umpire's chair and says, mm-hmm. judge, mm-hmm. overall. Yeah. So what are, what are yeah. some of the other, like you've asked me like what, what the Australian – mythos is yeah. that this story fits into what are, what are some of the other sort of well the th- i think there's a big thing about Novak Djokovic personally mm. as he as he fits into the pantheon of great tennis players right yeah. so if you think about the fact that he's world number one and if he wins the Australian Open he will have more Grand Slam titles than any other man in the history of tennis mm. And or singles titles because they always have you know oh, yeah. the Bryan brothers have won every single one or something. Yeah. But so he is on the verge of standing alone and not being on a par with uh, Rafa Nadal and Roger Federer. So, but in a way, because he wasn't as sort of immaculate as Roger Federer. Right, mm. he's he doesn't play. T- I mean, te- Roger Federer playing tennis is one of the most beautiful things you can ever see. His yeah. one-handed like backhand mm. is just. Yeah. it's about as efficient a movement as a human being can make to make with not happen. a piece of uh, w- right. not a hair out yeah. of place, and as it's he does all it. just yeah. immaculate. And out comes the perfect watch, you know, in time for the award ceremony and all sorts of stuff. Like he is. He is Switzerland personified. Yeah, and then you've got Rafa Nadal, who came in as this guy who was just going to hit the ball back every single time and determination and and grit and commitment he was going to get through it and Djokovic comes onto the scene as this kind of you know joker he does impressions of other tennis players but every time he's in a Grand Slam final and he's playing Federer or Nadal or even Murray when he used to be in them remember him (laughs) but those guys those guys have or are about to be surpassed by Novak Djokovic Mm-hmm. And for all the argument about, oh, well, who's really the greatest? Well, Federer won all these, you know, at Wimbledon and Nadal won the French Open every single year. For all those, he's outshone them and outlasted them. He is the mm-hmm. anvil and they are the mm-hmm. hammers that have been spent. Mm-hmm. You know. mm-hmm. yep. And and there's a weird, I think it's a conspiracy. I think Rafa Nadal <laughs> and COVID, Roger Federer no, have no, yeah, worked yes. together Oh, to to sabotage Djokovic. You, that you hear, heard wow. it here first. <laughs> yeah. That's what's going on. This is the the truth will out. Yeah, wow. and wow. and yeah, you'll see. see. You'll see. <laughs> you'll see what's going on here. So you no. think like it's got he... nothing to do with COVID? <laughs> It's all to do with Rafa Nadal. It's to do with Roger, glory. The, to do with the Swiss. It's to do with the glory. Yeah. So you think if he wasn't as good at tennis, people wouldn't be that bothered by this? Like if he was oh, just more yeah. likable, like well, if he if he was because he's not well, Mr. Personality, he's well, just no, efficient. He's, no, but he's person. He's got personality. He's probably got more personality in mm. terms of on the court and expression. Right, yeah. Than the he hasn't been two, backwards and right? coming forwards with his views. No, no. And but the issue is that he's got this sort of bizarre pantomime villain mm. yeah. figure which yes. is you're watching yes. tennis yes and the type of banter that happens yes. and you know the fact that every time andy murray ever plays tennis someone is going to say go on tim <laughs> 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 it's gonna happen someone's yeah. gonna do it because yeah. there's this kind of bizarre kind of almost closed community around yeah. tennis yeah and and within that without needing to be a proper villain, mm. he had got a reputation for you know being. It was always a bit disappointing when he beat Federer in 
Like when he beat Fenner in 20, when it was in 2019, mm -hmm. in the Wimbledon final, mm. and it went to a you know yeah, tie break yeah. in the final well, set or yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. All of that stuff, the, the, he was an underdog in a way. Yeah. Even though he was winning Grand Slam titles all the time. So, yeah. so I yeah. think within tennis, he has this odd position yeah. of being perhaps the greatest of all time when it comes to Grand Slam titles, but not being loved anywhere near as much no, as Federer no. and, He's a, and, and yeah. Nadal. He's a very yeah. polarizing character, and it, it seems to me he is either Christ or Satan, depending on whether <laughs> you're sort of pro vax or anti vax. Yeah, yeah. You know, the t today I heard two quotes by people. Um, so Martina Navratilova, yeah. you know, said, you know, I just wish he would. I, I know what his views are. I know he has his principles. But could he not sacrifice his principles, take one for the team, she said. Could he right. not take one for yeah, the team yeah. in order to bring life? Because, you know, wouldn't it be nice, you know, Serbia is not the most vaccinated country in the world. And if right. he led the way, okay. then others would follow and there would be life mm -hmm. through his sacrifice. And he is not, so, he's not being sufficiently Christ-like, sacrificing your principles yeah, yeah. for the sake of others. Um, and therefore, you know, he's a very bad man. Yeah. On the other on the other side, you know, people within his camp are calling him Christ. You know, like Jesus, he has been crucified for the sake of his values. You know, there yeah. he is, the one man standing yeah, yeah. up against the beast, and you know, and taking it, you know, for the team. And it just seems like we've all, everyone on on every every side has got a very Christian shaped imagination about this. Mm -hmm. It's just on what side of things you 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 land, and yeah, Novak is either the devil or Jesus. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, we're, we're going to move on from this in a second, but why don't, if you're, if you're watching at home, why don't you let us know in the comments? There you go, that's the question. Novak Djokovic, <laughs> is he Christ or is he <laughs> Satan? Yeah. Let us know okay. in the comments. Yeah. Yeah. Let us know what you think. We're going to um, dive down into um, our mailbag uh, for a moment here. Just going to think a little bit about some of the bits, comments we've had in this week from people about yeah. some previous videos um, and maybe think about what's going on with Speed Life. But we will come back to this in a moment. So if you're mm -hmm. you've have it sitting there thinking about this and thinking, you know what, I think this is the case with Djokovic, put it in the on the chat now and we'll come back to it in a moment, okay? Yeah, and, and specifically if you're with me on the this is a conspiracy. <laughs> conspiracy. The conspiracy. Nothing no. to do with COVID. <laughs> it's just the Nadal right. Federer Cabal. Mafia. The Nadal Cabal. Oh, the Nadal Cabal. <laughs> the Nadal Cabal. <laughs> the Nadal Cabal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it, it. it won't be. It. it will be. It will be someone else. I'll get to the bottom of this by the end of this episode. <laughs> is, is Soros involved? I don't know. It's like, oh, so. Dear me, dear me. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, one of, one of the like like the one of the big problems is like who cares? You know, like <laughs> you know, um, exactly. He's a That's he's the a, end of I tonight's show. Like tennis, like, right? He's a <laughs> tennis a player. He whacks a ball over a yeah, net, yeah. and 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 he is a polarizing figure. And yeah. maybe he's Christ, maybe he's Satan. But yeah. like, maybe he's a tennis player, <laughs> yeah. right? And and part of what the problem is is there's been a power vacuum at the top of our society where where after the death of God, so called, yeah. we don't have a religious dimension. We don't have a proper object of adoration and worship. And yeah. so what's happened is politics has now gone to number one in our lives, and politics is now heaven or hell. Oh which is makes everything supercharged. But then underneath politics, you've got entertainment and sport yeah. is now elevated to the political. And yeah. suddenly so many of our debates uh, about politics are involving sportsmen, you know, and sportswomen. Mm. And yeah. like these, these people, you know, they get up at six in the morning. If they're a swimmer, they just, they just follow a black line, you know, yeah. down the, yeah. if they're a rower, they, they get up at silly o'clock and just, and, and we, we look to them for why? Like, but within yeah. the within the rules, like it's the most, it's the greatest drama, right? It's the yeah. unscripted, right? Mm. Hopefully, right? <laughs> it, <laughs> Not according to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. be because within the confines of the game, once they're agreed, mm. it is it is the greatest drama. Yeah, and and the the one we want to see, right? The greatest drama we want to see is the team that are, you know, I mean, that's why the great comebacks, right? That's the story yeah. that everyone yeah. wants to say. I was there when, yeah. not when you thrash someone, you know, fifteen nil, yeah. right? 
Or three um, nil. Just or, just saying. Or fifteen you know. love. Yeah. <laughs> One one point, game over, right? <laughs> but not because you, you know, you what triple bageled someone six love, six love, six love. But when you were down match point, oh yeah, and you had nothing left, and somehow yeah. you managed to win that game. Twenty nineteen, headingly Ben Stokes on the yeah. Friday, England were down and out on Sunday morning. Yeah, and yeah. and that's the champion the, so, rises again. So to say that it's, I appreciate there is an elevation because these people. Why, if you're good at sport, should you have right <laughs> understanding of anything else, right? Yeah, yeah. But because we're looking for the hero to embody the full hero, yes, we are, we do want the 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 sporting hero to have moral virtue and to have courage yep. and yep. to have everything else, and so they're going to be loaded yep. with this because. Because they're heroic, right? And because we are messianic, yeah. and we have messianic hopes, yeah. and we're always trying to find a place to put them. And yeah. then when we put them yeah. in the wrong place and they fail us, like we crucify them, and we yes. like we do, you know, cut them down massively. Yeah. Um, it's yeah, it's part of human nature, isn't it? To to yeah to be tribal and to identify with your champion and to yeah mm. yeah. yeah. So within the game, it's you know, yeah, it's you are in one sense you are the Christ. Right. Once you, yeah. Once you score that goal, right? Yeah. You, so who do you, you know. say he is? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Some yeah. sage on the battle. Sorry. Well, we come, we come back. <laughs> anyway. We back. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. last week you guys did uh, a speakeasy without me. Just uh, well, I've been doing sorry. speakeasy without me. Seeing, <laughs> seeing other behind your back. Like, yeah. uh, so that was on Epiphany. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. Yes. And yes, it was. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you're quite right too. Um, and we have had some thoughts. We on were that. thinking of you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it meant nothing to us. It meant nothing. Um, we have had some comments in. You've been chatting on um, Twitter about this, haven't you, Glenn? Mm -hmm. uh, so Bianca Hotcraft uh, enjoyed it. She said, "Wow, I learned so much. Interesting things. Uh, so many interesting things about Epiphany that I didn't know before. Thanks a lot." And then she, she had said, an Epiphany. Epiphany. Mm. Nice. Mm. She said, I especially like the things you said about the astrology stuff. That part was, and still is, always the trickiest for me to understand. How could God use astrology to talk to people? Now I feel a bit more open to talk and think about it in a biblical way. Mm. Well, if it's in a biblical way, that's yeah. good. You yeah. Know, that's... yeah, don't just pick up any <laughs> astrologist or... <laughs> yes. At the back page, or something. Yeah. They are certainly <laughs> yes. As as we said, if you, if you didn't catch uh, the last episode, we we said um, the stars definitely are saying something, mm. but they're not saying that a tall, dark stranger is destined to come yes. across your path or to change jobs. The stars are not that into you. Yes. Um, the the universe. They haven't declared the glory of God. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> They're, they're no, just not they're that not, into you. They're not just. Yeah. But that's good. And that came up, I think, in part yeah. of that exchange there because you, you talk about Psalm 19. You mm -hmm. mentioned it here. I, I, presumably, you talked about it in the. Did we even mention? Yeah, we might have mentioned Psalm 19. Thing. It does because it came up on Twitter in your discussions because you mentioned okay. about the heavens are talking constantly. They declare the. The glory, the glory of, of God. Lord. Day after yeah. day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they declare knowledge. Yeah. So, so yeah, it, the the universe is screaming at us, and there is, there is a sense of Jesus is Lord. Creation's voice proclaims it, and we're wa we're walking mm. around, and mm. most of it, we're, we're yeah. not paying attention. Isn't it funny how we've sung? We probably sing that. You know, we sing that song. You know, yeah. Jesus is Lord. Creation's voice proclaims it. We know Psalm nineteen, but yet yeah. we are like. We as soon as we hear anything about people yeah, yeah. seeing something in the stars, it's written in the stars or whatever. We're all a bit like, yeah. whoa, hang on yeah. a second, like, yeah. And mm. like, so Augustine sort of spoke against it, um, uh, like in Confessions and in City of God, largely because there's a fatalistic astrology coming out of the Greek mindsets, where mm. so so Ptolemy comes up with. You know, he, he, well, he was the one who's really sort of codified the zodiac and things like that, um, and it was very much deterministic. And so, sort of, the classical understanding is that everything is determined by the fates; it's all determined by the stars. Mm. And what what Augustine objects to about the astrology that he inherited is the fatalism of it. Mm. Um, that we that if the stars are sort of parallel to the angels, in a sense, outside of Christ, we are 
determined by the elements and the mm. heavenly bodies are above us and we just we just accept our fate but in Christ we've been raised above the heavens right and that there's there's actually an amazing freedom that we have and we're, we're not determined by the stars so when he was reacting against astrology it wasn't that the stars are saying stuff it, it was that you're not determined by this stuff you're determined by Christ mm. and you've been freed from the natural world in that that sort of way and so um, astrology as divination is of course outlawed in the Bible and yeah. you know the Bible's got lots to say against divination and all and, mm. and thinking that you you know the future through it and all that kind of stuff mm. but astrology as discerning through the spectacles of Scripture what the creation is saying um, I think there's a place for it and What's a horoscope? Because <laughs> big, big questions. Yeah. I read in one recently that oh. um, there were two men who were trying to prevent another man from getting ahead of them. And I was like, oh, what does that mean? And it turns out that the name of the first one, E-R, keeps repeating. E-R, E-R, E-R. Federer, <laughs> Roger. Second one, lots of A's. Rafa, Nadal. T turns out, this yeah, is this is this is Nostradamus kind of. But uh, what is a horoscope, level. right? Because what is a horoscope? Okay. So, and because it's why is hours. it not called yeah. reading your astro astrology in the back? Like, what's the connection? It's a, what's yeah, the so the horoscope is the scope. You're you're looking at the horror, which is the time or the hours. Okay, and so. Above, above us, you can divide the heavens into 12 hours or 12 okay. houses, 30 degrees each for the 360 degrees around us. And right. so, and one of them has been named Sagittarius and Aries and Leo and right. Libra okay. and, and around they go. And so the horoscope is looking for where the sun moves through Sagittarius or the sun moves through right. Libra. Okay. And that sort of thing. But so those 12, which is a bit significant, you know, mentioned that the other day and we, we need to get someone else on who knows the yeah. world a bit more. Yeah, than yeah. Than Libra, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> which is true every week. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that thing of the, yeah, um, the fact that they haven't, they've, they, they see 12 houses of the zodiac or signs tw that is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is interesting and yeah. interesting yeah. that you know this the book of nature and the book of scripture would have these kind of overlaps and similarities and inordinate amounts of nonsense talked in yes. this area yeah, yeah, yeah. like by me and and yes. yeah. everybody and and and, and so you, you take it all with massive punches okay. of salt but if if we're at least open enough to be able to say that the that the heavens are declaring something Mm. Then you know, isn't it interesting that there's a, isn't it interesting that there's a house called Virgo, the Virgin, yeah, and yeah, there's Leo, yeah, and yeah, you know, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, these these things might have scriptural significance, and yeah, I don't know, yeah. and and certainly, and what brought it up was Epiphany, yeah, that you've got this these Babylonian astrologers who you know Daniel was in Babylon, well, we think they were Babylonian, but who knows, but but Daniel was certainly in Babylon, and there are certainly Hebrew predictions that there will there will be a scepter a star that comes out of you know the yeah. east and and this will be the great ruler and they have enough scriptural knowledge alongside their astrological knowledge and following that leads them to jerusalem once they get to jerusalem they need yeah. the scriptures again yeah mm. um they get to Micah yeah. five and oh it's bethlehem mm. um and so i'm not saying you know, I'm not saying you can sort of follow the stars in any kind of non-scriptural, non-Christ-centered way. Yeah. But with Christ at the center and with the scriptures as your guide, yeah. I don't know. I, you know, you can, yeah. call me crazy. We, we're both coming across as crazies today, yeah, aren't we? Wow. Like you, That's you and your cabal, role. Nabal, Nabal, yeah. cabal, <laughs> Nadal, cabal. Do you mean? Yeah. Well, fine. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, it's if your you, turn to be loopy next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. try my best. Yeah. Uh, so In you, fact, talking about tennis and astrology, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> did you know that John McEnroe, the famous brat, you cannot be serious. You cannot be serious. I'm serious. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. Oh. Dear me, I stole it from you. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Dude. Dude. Uh. <laughs> 
<laughs> how, no, how are you going to develop it? No, I, no, I'm no, intrigued it's now. It's right. Jumped in oh, there. It's, You're going to oh, think I'm it's so fine. sorry. It's fine. <laughs> yep. it's fine. Well, if you missed that episode, you can check it out because it's up on YouTube. It's our previous video from this one. So do go and find it because there's lots of good stuff in there. Some people have been chatting, though, about uh, Novak um, Djokovic. Have they been kind? Uh, y- yeah. So um, Novak's. So, um, well, Christoph Keating definitely, he says he definitely thinks Nadal is wishing Djokovic doesn't play. So, I think, mm. so he says, I'd go with the cabal for sure. <laughs> so, there we go. Yep. Uh, but Jackie Knoll says, Goody has the courage to stand up against having to have the vaccine. Shouldn't it still be personal choice? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Well, I, I think that that is, like, in, in terms of, the camps you know the vaccinated and the unvaccinated i'm very um i'm very despairing of whether we're gonna like have Mm. these massive sort of ghettos and the clean and the unclean and i'm you know i'm pro vaccine myself (laughs) but i i I certainly don't want to live in a world where you lock up the unvaccinated and try to compel them Um, well i was convinced quite early on that depending on what vaccine you had Okay. You would have to move into different parts of the country. <laughs> so like, Wales is now for anyone who had Moderna. <laughs> and uh, if you had Pfizer for both shots, you have to live within the M25. <laughs> so just like this <laughs> sectioning everyone up, like a really? tribal realignment. But uh, I think, yeah, so the, the so freedom and safety, you know, are, yeah. are two you know, values that are kind of battling them battling it yeah. out in that discussion mm. and you know in the in the ancient world you know we caesar augustus would make a decree and he's yeah. like you got to go back to the place of your birth and, and yeah. everyone would go and there's no sense of individual freedom and you know <laughs> you don't kick back against yeah. the the emperor um yeah you are very much determined you know from on mm. high and we have learned through jesus and through the christian revolution about the value of the individual and i think that's that's something on the on the the libertarian side of things, the freedom loving side of things that says, well, I don't Mm. want to be forced to have something put into my body. Mm. Um, That is drawing on some rich Christian tradition that says, um, you know what, your individual rights should not get lost in the shuffle and you shouldn't be punished for the sake of the whole and you have human rights. You know, that's a precious Christian idea. Um, but you've also got to deal globally with a pandemic and we do have to be all in it together. Yeah. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's that balance of the, you know, the, the, the health concern and the liberty concern, which mm. translate that you've got life and choice, you know? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and there's pro-life and pro-choice. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I guess, yeah, people will probably land in different spots on these things. So, um, yeah. Be kind to each other in the comments. Yeah. Um, but yeah. if you're if you're watching this uh, after the fact, so we're not you know, when it's no longer live. If you still have thoughts, do pop stuff down in the comments, and we'll try and get back to you. Um, but also, one way you could continue the conversation would be to be able to join us on our Discord server. Now, to do that, um, you would have to sign up to be someone who gives to us. I mm-hmm. think is that correct? Yeah. Uh, so obviously, we can only do uh, the Ministry of Speak Life because of donations from people like mm-hmm. yourself. Um, so we're entirely reliant on um, your generosity. So um, if you feel you might be able to support us financially in any way, please head over to speaklife.org.uk forward slash give, and there are lots of ways uh, there. Of various ways you can give and then of course because of that one of those privileges you get one of the perks is to come and join us on the discord server and there's more conversation it's growing isn't it growing community mm-hmm. more stuff going on there um so if you've got thoughts on the nadal cabal mm-hmm. and all those things you can come and i you saw a conspiracy birthed right here <laughs> yeah, it's, so, it's, like, it's exciting QAnon, right? <laughs> cabal <laughs> The N- Nadal Cabal Natal. That would be <laughs> the birth of, yeah. But anyway. <laughs> so, well, noted. Moving <laughs> swiftly on, um, we've got a new section now in the Speakeasy, which doesn't have a name yet. So <gasps> we want you. We do want a name. We need, yeah, we need a name. So we yeah. want you guys to come up with the name or help us come up with the name. So as we do this, please yeah. put suggestions down in the chat. Yeah. Um, but each week, at least for the next few weeks, we're going to be taking uh, a brief look at a film. Um, and discussing some of the themes that come out of it and how they connect to the Christian story. And so the catch is that uh, the following week, after each movie, one of us will have to choose another film, but it needs to be linked some way to the previous week's film. So, for example, in a moment, Nate's going to talk to us a bit about the film The Green Mile. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so next week, for example, could be any Tom Hanks film because mm. he's in the Green Mile. Or it could yes. be any cast member or even like, I don't know who directs that film, but... Frank Darabont. Any Frank Darabont film, it could be that thing. So it's sort of like a film yep. tag. Mm-hmm. Like yep. tag you're it, you know, you've yep. got Tom... I yep. say Tom Cruise then, it's Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks. Yeah. Um, so whilst Nate's sharing a bit about Green Mile, put your thinking caps on mm. and see what could this section be Because you're going called? next, aren't you? I'm you're going next. next. Yeah, so next week. So in the comments, nominate what uh, <laughs> you've got. Say what the, the most obscure. Yeah. <laughs> but oh, the other thing, the other rule is... Oh, it's got to be more than 10 years old, is that it? It has to be more than 10 years old. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that is that is because we're actively working to avoid just chasing the trends as we do at the top of the show <laughs> <laughs> we'll just look at whatever's the biggest sure, hashtag and go with that also we feel much more free to give spoilers as well like yeah, if, I mean, if that's, it's more that's than 10 true. years old yeah yeah. Like, yeah yeah but also and again and, and again and this is something we've talked about uh within the foundry unlocked and our our understanding of storytelling and our understanding of of film and tv and everything else is that we aren't just looking at this for Oh, where's there a evangelistic hook right. that I can get into? Hey, the kids are all into Spider-Man, so let's now try and find a Jesus moment in the Spider-Man movie, mm-hmm. and then we can get them in. He bites you, he transforms you from the inside out. That's it. There you go. Yeah. And How does Jesus bite you? <laughs> this is the spirit. We uh, bite him, bite right? Jesus. We bite him. <laughs> um, Paul, that's no, a Pelagian yeah. gospel. Yes. We yes. bite Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the so so the view that we we have here at Speak Life in terms of films is we live in 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 Christ's universe, mm. and as we've just said, when it comes to astrology, right, the heavens declare the glory of God, right. Mm-hmm. So Jesus is Lord, creation's voice proclaims it. Mm. That's our starting point. To use um, Abraham Kuyper's line, there is no square inch of the whole cosmos over which Jesus Christ does not say, mine. So we're, we're fully convinced that Jesus um, runs the show, and it's yep. all about him, and that we are made in his image, as the Bible teaches, and that we've fallen from that. So therefore, when we find a great film, find a great story, what we're saying is we're expecting to see... Yeah shadows and types and echoes and whispers of hmm. the true story yeah because kind of that's the only stuff we've got to work with yeah that's so Ste- i mean so stephen king has said about writing stories in yeah. on writing he says stories are found things like fossils yeah so stephen king who wrote the green mile has this yeah. sense that there are these given patterns and stories that are already pre-existent in the world yeah and we're kind of saying yes stephen and yeah. s- and the, you know the the shape of that dinosaur yeah. or whatever it is yeah. is Christ shaped. So, yeah. yeah, and and that we <laughs> to stretch the analogy, no, Christ sorry. shaped dinosaur <laughs> it just bites you. Yeah. The comment, Christopher, Christoph Keating. Oh. We bite Jesus. Glenn Scrivener, twenty twenty two. John six. Taste and see. John oh, six. Bitten, Christoph. Yeah. Unless you, you unless you eat the flesh of the Jesus. Son of Man yeah. and drink of drink his blood, you have no part <laughs> with <Right>. him. Christoph. <laughs> In your face. Um, <laughs> Christoph. <laughs> Bite Jesus. <laughs> 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 Anyway, Nate, the Green Mile. <laughs> yeah. In the Street Bible, actually, say, Jesus says, "Bite me." Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. That's this is a hard teaching, dude. <laughs> um, so, so 1999. 1999. Yes. Uh, a Stephen King uh, book, The Green Mile, mm. is made into a um, a movie, and it's called The Green Mile, and it stars Tom Hanks. And he plays Paul Edgecombe, I think is his name. And he is a prison warden on death row. And it's called the Green Mile because uh, the, the, the floor, the mile that you sort of apparently walk the mile uh, from your final prison cell to the uh, electric chair, um, the floor is green. So it's called the Green Mile. And he runs this um, prison in a way that doesn't undermine the how guilty the prisoners are and doesn't question the fact that they need to face justice and that that justice is, is in this case, the death penalty, 
but also doesn't undermine the humanity and the dignity of those who come in. Mm. And so it's very interesting the way that that story is set up to say, we have a place here in which dead men are walking mm. and all are under the sentence of death. And yet within that place, Stephen King wants to have someone who takes charge of that place who will pray, may God have mercy on your soul at the point at which you know the the execution is called for. So it's a very interesting setup just from that perspective. Mm. But then the the thing that's obviously most memorable about the film The Green Mile is the character of John Coffey, like the drink but not spelt the same, mm -hmm. who is this giant of a man uh, who is brought in because he's been uh, charged with the, the rape and murder of two girls. And so he's brought in and effectively what unfolds within the story is that this John Coffey character, J.C., mm. is able to heal and redeem and bring life mm. in a way which causes you to question the nature of his being in this prison. Mm. And there are other characters, um, uh, Percy Wetmore, mm. who is a very kind of... Um, vindictive and twisted mm. uh, character. He's an assistant sort of prison guard. And he, the, the great drama of it is that they're trying to get him off the Green Mile because he doesn't respect the dignity of the inmates. Mm. He doesn't respect their humanity. And he has this perverse interest in watching the executions. Mm. And so he's quite twisted. And so the big tension is how are they going to get rid of him off the Green Mile well, it's tricky because they hate him, but they can't just dismiss him because his aunt is the some kind of state governor or something like that. Mm. Therefore, they get into this sort of pact to say, okay, we'll let you go up front during an execution. And once you've done that, you will put in your transfer request straight away. So I think re-watching it, mm. um, I mean, it's about three hours, I think. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah. It, it, just a reminder, it's such a beautiful film in lots of ways and raises incredible questions about what do we think justice is, what do we think life is, how do you account for the fact that we have this, this supernatural activity going on within it. Um, yeah, gorgeous film. Mm. And it wasn't only because it stars Mr. Jangles, Mr. Jingles, who's a mouse, uh, and we obviously just made a film about a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> but that could, maybe, yep. is that a link? Is that a sufficient link to go from mouse to mouse? Yeah, it could be. Our mouse did not star in the Green Mile, I should say. So right. there isn't actually because a, they survived for less than a year. A literal link. <laughs> <laughs> although, he, although, although, that mouse, no spoilers. Yeah, but that mouse yeah, might a be a bit special. Color. Ours was white. Mm. Yeah. There's, yeah. Something, there's something so Christian about the Green Mile in that it's it's set in a world in which execution is the, the machine that is kind of grinding along. Yeah. And in a sense, the ancient world was a machine that was ground along and, yeah. and sort of the, the cross as the slave's death was how things operated. Because um, there's no way you can have so many millions of slaves in the Roman Empire. Yeah. Um, like the the danger of a slave's uprising was always ever present, and therefore you have to be brutal. You have to crush them. You have to devise like yeah. the most brutal way of of shaming and killing, mm. which is what the cross was. Which and the equivalent is kind of the the, the electric chair, mm. really. And and yet you have someone who shows up on a cross upending the world and upending your your views of who is the guilty and who really are the brutal ones and yeah. who, who really deserves to live and doesn't yeah. and 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 so like in a, in a sense like if a christian made that film you'd sort of be like oh man it's it's too yeah yeah, yeah. you know it's too on the nose yeah. it's too yeah. um but it is it, it is like a passion play Mm. In so many ways. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, 
and 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 such you know it's a great story you know Stephen King obviously wrote the book on it but in terms of the the filmmaking it's just it's just really great to watch is a it's a now should say the scene there are scenes of a deeply distressing nature so mm -hmm. obviously it's you know it, mm -hmm. it has a mm -hmm. 18 rating or 18, R rating yeah, or something yeah, yeah. because it's you know could be botched execution at one stage and um, all that was, yeah so so which you know the things you can always put you use that bizarre function of mm -hmm. double speed on mm -hmm. a film mm -hmm. uh, which Netflix now apparently offers mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> don't know why anyone would ever want to do that maybe this is the time to come into its own but I'm yeah very busy man, Nate, yeah but... brilliant brilliant film um and I think it it really gets into the questions of of justice mm. and of the longing for this innocent one mm. um who will bring healing yeah and the and the way he brings healing is the great exchange mm. Mm. it it is yeah, to yeah. take yeah. the darkness yeah. and to respond with light yeah. um, he inhales mm. death basically that's what he does and then yeah. is able to breathe out life yeah. yeah and enact judgment and that this is one of the other things yeah. you sort of which which is interesting as you it comes up within the film which is you haven't just got this kind of very simple-minded i'm just trying to be nice i'm just doing nice things can i help oh i'm in bad circumstances i've died right it's mm. not that kind of thing yeah. you actually have a situation towards the end of the film in which justice is done yeah and right. within the sense of the film, you are completely convinced that that was the right thing. Yes. You know, the, the poetic justice of yes. that act Man. Um, Man. is far more satisfying yeah. than if things had just been sort of left to run their course yes. in terms of the, yes. the, the plot of the film up to that point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And th yeah. Th there's a link that I've only thought about today, which is that one year later, Lars von Trier released a film called Dancer in the Dark, mm. in which Björk, it's a musical, but it's the most tragic, brutal musical yeah. in the world. And Björk is on death row. And, you know, the film ends, it's been 20 years, so I don't mind saying it ends with her being hanged. And right. she, like that, the, yeah, the yeah. very final scene is like, and she's singing because it's a musical. She's singing right. right up to the point where she's hanged and mid song. Yeah. Legs swinging the end. Yeah. And it strikes me as that is, that is a tale that you tell on death row when you have a tragic view of life when mm. you when you have the, the classical view of there's the fates yeah and because it, it's just a conveyor belt towards death and and she's innocent but it doesn't matter because mm. that's the kind of universe we live in yeah. in which you just get crushed and at the end there's death and mm. that's that and it's just a really interesting comparison it seems to me between Lars von Trier giving very much the sort of the classical tragedy yeah and you you get very different notes, yeah. don't you, yeah. from from the Green Mile, and yeah. somehow there's it it plums exactly the same depths. It takes yeah. you on exactly the same trajectory, and yet there is, yeah, the, you know, what do they say? The difference between tragedy and comedy is when the curtain falls. You know, yes. the, the curtain falls on Björk hanging, mm. and that's it. There's an extra scene in the Green yeah. Mile, yeah, and that that's what's made all the difference in the world. But and also the way in which you depict those things. So it's not. It, it's interesting to see how a, a film or a story, or a TV show, can show the same plot points, mm. but what are the choices you've made about your representation of that thing? Mm. Um, so yes, um, another film which obviously wouldn't fit into this category because it's less than ten years old, but um, is the Ma Marriage Story, yeah, by Noah Baumbach. Wow, yeah. The way they choose to end, depict the ending of that film suggests to you that it ended happily and it was, it was in that sense, classic comedy. It was sort of a nice, happy ending. And they all lived happily ever after. Yeah. But when you actually look at what happened over the duration of the film, you're like, no, this was, a tra this was tragic. Mm. But you've painted sin in virtue's colors. You've, you've sort of, mm. you've depicted it in, in such a way. And so that's the challenge is to say, okay, if you have characters who are sympathetic to the plight of the suffering of the unjust, then 
you will need to portray those things in, in, in not in sentimental ways, but in ways which, which understand the nature of, of the mortality of human life yeah. as being potentially tragic, but with, with, a, with a ringing bell of hope somewhere yeah. yeah whereas maybe and i've not seen the dance in the dark but um the i'm imagining that there is no such softening of the blow if it's just a case of you know dangling feet yeah yeah there's a there's a, a total fragility of bjork's character and okay. and you, your heart just breaks for her but yep. there is there is it is just all brutality at the end and she's yeah. snuffed out can i just ask one question because i know i know time okay. is flying but um the power of a story like the green mile is you can watch John Coffey, and you, you, like when the reveal comes that he was entirely innocent and, yeah. and that he's giving himself in love and all that yeah. kind of stuff, that can make me cry yeah. in a way that you know, I wouldn't ordinarily cry in a worship service in church or yeah. when I'm reading the scriptures. Yeah, yeah. And yet, you know, I'm reading about the death of Jesus for me, yeah. and I'm not crying. I'm, reading, I'm watching this made-up story by Stephen King. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm a blubbering wreck. Is that a yeah. bad thing? How should I think about that? I think well, it's it's the thing of of study. Don't just feel your emotions. Kind of study them in a way, right? Mm. That's not to say absolutely in every moment. Like snap yourself out out of you know <laughs> whatever it is you're feeling and observe yourself <laughs> in any sort of way. Yeah. But when you watch a beautiful film, which has a profound effect on you reflect on that ask what was it about that film that was so powerful mm. don't dismiss it as oh so sad wasn't it and then off you go right <laughs> and don't just sort of say oh it was manipulation and we should right. avoid no, this at yeah, all yeah. costs mm. yeah ask what was true about this yeah that meant that it worked and if you, there are things which affect us and we think ah i'm not sure about that we should reflect on that as well mm -hmm. and and contemplation of your own experience watching a great piece of you know cinema or, or whatever it is mm. is an important part of your christian reflection yeah um yeah and that when we just go oh this is about worldview analyze it get the worldview bang and <laughs> now we've got a you know yeah, connection yeah, yeah. with the culture or an in for an evangelistic conversation yeah we've dismissed the art itself yeah. And we've bo boiled it down to something that it isn't. Yeah. Whereas when we engage it as it is on its own terms and and fall under its spell in a way, mm -hmm. and then we come out of that and we reflect on it. Why was that powerful? What was mm. true? And as you know, in the same way as I would look at the stars, what is this teaching me about Christ? Yeah. As I look at the movie stars, I should do the same. <laughs> nice. And thank you very much. Dear we'll me. leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> so where Wendy Lomont says, uh, I always thought a lot of Stephen King's work as very Christian, yeah. even a lot of his scariest stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, ideas uh, for a name, I yes. think we've only got one here. Emily Rodder said, Talk Easy. Play on the old nickname Talky for films. Talkies. Yep. Yep. She says, maybe not the suggestion you'd expect from a 25-year-old, but there you go. Talkies. Oh, yeah. I don't think we had any other suggestions for a name, although there's a lot of love for uh, from Christoph Keating and uh, Robert Pizer. I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, for the next film to be Galaxy Quest. Galaxy Quest? Because, what's the link? Sam Rockwell was in Green Sam Mile and Rockwell. Galaxy Quest, which also has Tim Allen, who was in Toy Story with Tim Hanks. It's full circle, so, so Galaxy Quest for me. We could actually we, just go around three we, films we, constantly. We <laughs> Toy Story, Galaxy I'll Quest. I'll Toy Story and then you do Green Mile again. Would, or would just every film is Tom Hanks is a Tom Hanks film. Maybe oh. that's the thing. We call this the Tom the, Hanks film Tom appreciation Hanks section. Yeah. <laughs> we call Theological T Hanks for all the memories. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. dear. Well, yeah. On that note, we definitely got Thanks for watching. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, guys, uh, hopefully you've enjoyed uh, tonight's episode. As always, give us a like and a subscribe here on YouTube. Um, that's always helpful for us, helpful for you guys to see the stuff that's coming out as well. And it means hopefully you'll see all the other videos that we bring out. Um, if you can follow us on things like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, even TikTok, we're on all the social medias, so please do follow us there. Um, and yes, yeah, so thanks for joining us on the Speakeasy. It's been a bit of a different format tonight, but we hope you've enjoyed it. Do let us know what you think, because we're going to keep on tweaking it a little bit. And uh, thanks to Nate and Glenn for joining me. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. And uh, we'll see you again next week. See ya.